Chapter 7. Velvet Remedy. They actually considered us gods. But then, who can blame them? Her! She was still as beautiful as the first time I saw her. It had been the birthday party for the Overmare's daughter. Velvet Remedy had come to sing her a stunning version of the happy birthday song. I had been painfully jealous of the filly for weeks. Actually, she was even more gorgeous than the last time I saw her. I'd followed her out into this wasteland. To see her now, against this backdrop of rusted metal, old hardwood, bloodstains, and liquor, her songs so clear and majestic through the din of low lives, made her breathtaking in comparison. My heart fluttered like a butterfly trapped in a jar. Part of me wanted to run to her. Part of me, small but insistent, wanted to be furious with her, to blame her for getting me involved. It didn't matter that the only pony who forced me out of the stable door was me. My eyes flickered back to the guards making their rounds. Even if they weren't looking in my directions, in moments they wouldn't be able to miss me. Following either cry of my heart was out. Instead, I scooted back silently and retreated the way I came. This threw a new wrinkle in the plan. Now, getting Velvet Remedy out of captivity was my highest priority. Not to suggest the other ponies in the cages were any less important to me, but something personal had been added to the situation. In my head, I entertained the thought of just how happy she would be to see me. The moment I stepped outside, I knew I was in trouble. Multiple slaver ponies, lanterns strapped to their backs, were standing around the corpses of the flamethrower's bastard I put down. The wake of my activities was not going unnoticed, or ignored. Four of the ponies, those most slightly armored, turned and ran towards the huge central barn. I pressed myself against the wall. The alarm was about to go up. A single gunshot rung out through the storm, and the lead pony dropped from two bullet wounds. Three of the runners skidded to a muddy stop and dove for cover, trying to spot their attacker. The third kept running, and he nearly made it to the barn, close enough that the barn door was splattered with red when Calamity took him down. Most of the four more heavily armored slavers spotted Calamity on that last dive and began firing in his direction. But he was fast, lightning was bad, and I had not been impressed by the aim of his slavers yet tonight. I was pleased and utterly unsurprised when the hail of assault rifle ammo thrown in Calamity's direction missed my companion entirely. But now, these four were working in a group, moving towards the barn while covering each other, denying Calamity any safe vector of approach. Moving quickly, I raced down the catwalk and towards one of the old, half-collapsed wooden buildings surrounding the mega barn. Shotgun, reloaded and ready. It was locked. I spilled several bobby pins and almost fumbled the screwdriver in my haste. The lock was stubborn and tricky, and every failure was making me more jumpy. I desperately wished I had another mintal, preferably of the party time variety. The bobby pin broke. Behind me, the noises from the central barn changed drastically. The singing stopped, and the drunken hollers were replaced by authoritative shouts. Frantically pulling out another bobby pin, I tried again. I could hear the barn doors swing open, ponicidal slavers tearing out into the storm. Cries for blood and rape and death, and it struck me like a blow to my gut. That which vitrally was directed towards me. If those slavers caught me, I'd only wish I was a dead pony. The door's lock finally gave. Without seconds to lose, I dove inside. Pow, 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 pow! 
Four rapid shots from the combat shotgun, and the slaver guards and sides, gambling at the table, covered in bottle caps and cigarette buds, went down before they had time to react to my presence. It only hit me a moment later that I had just opened fire based solely on what they looked like, what they were wearing, and that they were armed in a place like this. Had I not just done, in essence, what Calamity did when he opened fire on me? Only I had murdered these two, and even in retrospect, had no reason to believe my admittedly fear-fueled instincts had been wrong. One of the dead ponies had a pair of monocles as a cutie mark, and the other had keys both on the front door cage that took up two-thirds of the room. My eyes widened at what I saw before me. This was not like the cages to the Ponyville Library. There were no prisoners behind these bars. Instead, there were weapons and boxes of ammo. Some stacked on top other boxes of ammo. I was in the armory. Two thoughts raced through my mind, each right on the heels of the other. I had just hit the jackpot, and this was probably right where most of the slavers were headed first. Swiftly, I turned and locked the door, then began to barricade it. Not too heavily, as trapping myself in here was not going to save any pony, least of all myself. But it would give me time, time to loot and to consider my next move. A filing cabinet, the table, and the metal desk should do. Bottle caps and gambling chips slid to the floor in chaos as I unpenned the table and placed it against the door. I levitated the filing cabinet against it to hold it in place, and then the desk was wrapped with a glow identical to that as my horn as I swung it around. The desk, I noticed, had a glowing terminal. Time allowing, it might be worth it to see what it had to say. First, however, was improving my armament. Seven boxes of ammo, half of them locked, two gun cabinets, and a weapons locker, also locked, later, I was less like a pony and more like a walking arsenal. There were dozens of weapons, but all in such crappy condition that I was only able to scavenge three useful ones out of them, including a needler pistol, a repair assist spell for my pit buck, allowing me to swiftly tear down the worst of the weapons for their parts. The weapon locker contained two battle saddles, both far too heavy for me to bother with. I now had ammo for everything but little Macintosh, including weapons I had never seen before, such as spark packs designed for recharging magical energy weapons, and three missiles. It disturbed me greatly that the slavers had a small stockpile of missiles, particularly because neither of the battle saddles were built for them. But by far, the biggest prize in the lot had been neither a weapon nor ammo, but a set of schematics for creating a homemade gun that would fire poison needles. It would be silent, crippling, and I was pretty sure I'd seen most of the parts required back in absolutely everything. The slavers took little time figuring out I'd barricaded myself in their armory. If that gave them pause, however, they didn't show it. Relocking the door had been a useless effort. The first pony to the armory had her own set of keys. The table, cabinet, and desk were proving much more worthwhile, and by the time I had finished repairing the weapons I was taking, they had finally ceased bucking their hooves at the door. I had no doubt that they were waiting outside to quietly ambush, but that gave me a little more time. I used it to look at the terminal. It took almost no time to hack it. The password was terminal. I was unimpressed. The first entry was ancient, dating back several years before the apocalypse. The others were all within the last few months. Entry 1. Had a surprise inspection from the Ministry of Morale yesterday. We pretty well knew it was coming, and I'd have been given instructions on what to do. I couldn't believe how smoothly it went. We slip them a small percentage of the special product, and they give us clean marks, 
Even if they were dirty, I couldn't understand why they wouldn't bring the cage down on us and impound all of it for themselves. Seems too good to be true. So I did a little digging, and a friend of a friend working over at Ironshod, who claims to have an inside peek, gave me this apple to chew on. According to him, the head mayor of MOM herself actually loathes the new contraband laws. And since MOM enforces these laws, that means all sorts of tasty zebra treats are slipping into Equestria right under the princess's nose. I figure this means as long as she says, Golden Delicious, they're Golden Delicious. And, even if the princess suspects her, and how dense would she be to not, she really is the one pony the MOM can't bring up on sedation charges. Entry 2. Finally wiped the crap from this terminal. 300 plus documents that I have absolutely no use for, many of which is probably best not to be recorded of. All except this one damn file for forever ago with the weird ass flag on it that prevents tampering. And trust me, I've tried. Don't know why I even bother keeping records of these when we send the goods, since they're all going to the same damn place anyway. I don't know what the hell Stern needs all these slaves for, but unless she's building an army, whatever it is has one hellish rate of attrition. Boss is more worried about the attention rates in transit. A third of these fuckers don't make the journey, and Stern ain't paying us none for corpses. I'm supposed to figure out a way to keep the damn goods alive, at least until after caps exchange hooves. Maybe a cocktail of drugs will help. Found a false floor last week, leading to a buried boxcar, just full of the stuff. Entry 3. I finally convinced the boss that we need to start a little side business in the fold market. The young ones are easier to corral, control, and train. Sure, we have to play up the investment angle, since they can't do the work of a normal slave, but there are plenty of ponies out there who see the potential. Unfortunately, Stern ain't one of them. That bitch has no patience. Turns out, a mixture of a buck and dash in small doses does mighty well in keeping the more worthless slaves from keeling over before they make it to Philadelphia. What happens to them after Stern gets her hooves on them ain't none of my concern. Still gotta talk to Whipcrack about getting a bit easier on them though. No drug cocktail is going to prevent a pony from being lashed to death. I suggest swapping out slaves, which are pulling the wagons a bit more often, too. Entry 4. The cells in the old sheriff's station have been perfect for foal holding. The settlers of Appaloosa might have constructed a lot of this place with an eye to speed over lastingness, but they sure knew how to make a holding pen. I'd even say that the cells in there are a close second to a list of stuff I'm glad they left behind when they all kicked the bucket, next to that apple pie recipe. It turns out, gathering foals had made hitting isolated homesteads a much better risk. The parent folk have a tendency to get annoyingly shooty when we come to claim them, but they also make such great pains to keep the little ones out of the fight that even we have to kill the adults, we still make a good profit. Entry 5. What a fucking cock-up. A whole shipment. Two wagons worth. Slaughtered. Best we can figure, they ran into a stray hellhound. Damn tainted fucks everything up. Now, I hear that Stern is sending a special representative to take a look-see at our operation. Sounds more like to me she's planning on taking over. I think she's in for a face-bucking surprise. And this special representative best watch her tail. Got a new herd of foals ready for burking. Breaking. Raking in the caps with the last batch. Another benefit of dealing in foals you only have to kill one of them in front of the others to take the fight out of them. Entry 6. The last week has been beyond words. 
Stern was playing it close to her chest with that special representative business. I never had any idea. Let's just say I was shaking in my shotting when our new boss heard about some of the stuff I'd been saying back when we didn't know her. But I guess it's easy to be understanding when you're connected to the divine. Besides, we still have what's left of the old boss as a reminder that the new boss's hooves ain't soft. The new acquisition is going to do wonders for keeping slaves up. Good thing, too, since the new boss don't cotton to the black and dash trick. Fortunately, I was able to convince her that was Applecore's idea. Poor Applecore. Never saw it coming. All hail the living goddess. By the time I was done reading, I could set the town on fire with the heat of my seething. Mentally, I was adding the fool's cages to my list of objectives where I fought where I fought with Velvet Remedy for first place. Emotionally, I was seething. I don't want to be hidden away in a barricaded room anymore. I wanted to go out there and hurt some fucking evil ponies. Sometimes, the wasteland listens to what you want and gives it to you with all four hooves. I had barely backed away from the terminal, stomping around angrily as I tried to gather enough focus to move the desk, when my barricade exploded inwards with a fury and shrapnel. Blood and agony burst from my body as I was thrown back against the wall. My head slammed into the armory cage for a moment, and I lost consciousness. The slavers had launched a missile at the door. Trembling with shock and pain, I greedily gulped down another healing potion. Already, my wounds were closing. Calamity held my left foreleg in place, so the gash that nearly severed it could do its work. The wound was beyond ugly. Even with potions, I would be lame until a real medical pony could treat it. Candy seemed horribly far away, and that was assuming she even had the skills. Fortunately, Calamity calmed me. A missile launching battle saddle, taking some effort to aim correctly, meaning that any pony short of an expert with the things could be painting herself for each launch. And that made her an easy target. Almost too easy for a shot like Calamity. When I stood at, could stand again, though still wobbly, I hastily filled Calamity in on what I discovered. He gave me an appraising look as I danced around, saying anything about Velvet that would lay bare in my heart. Then, thankfully, trotted back to take a quick peek at the battle saddles. Neither, he declared at a glance, were significantly similar to his own to even raid for spare parts. We didn't dare spend any further time in the armory. The slavers would be back at any moment. We decided to split up. I would look for Velvet Remedy while he highlighted it to the sh sheriff's office, where he would scout out the place and hopefully take out any guards. I would meet him there as soon as I unlocked the cages, but until then he couldn't rally the foals, or at least give them hope and the first friendly company since being captured. Slipping out, we parted ways and slid into the storm. The slavers missed us by seconds. I quickly slid the box car shut to behind me. Outside, the bright rectangle of light I had opened shrank and vanished back into darkness. She was here. It's about time. Her tail was to me, and she faced a wall with three yellow boxes arranged so their butterflies were in a rectangular pattern. I can't very well do any good sitting in here. She had turned a glance towards me. Now she turned slowly towards me, staring. Oh. No. For the last half hour, fantasies had played through my head, imagining the expression on her face when I found her. The surprise. The joy. This was an ether. Oh. Oh dear. Her eyes traveled to my face. 
to my stable till utility barding. Still quite recognizable, even with Did See Do's improvements. To the pit buck on my foreleg. Velvet Remedy looked shocked and sad. What are you doing here? She asked, taking a breath. I stood tall. I followed you out of the stable. Came across the equestrian wastelands to find you. I'm here to rescue you. I gave her my best, winning smile. Then, worrying at how I might have sounded, I added meekly, I'm not stalking you. Aren't you now? She shook her head and pranced around almost as if in distraught. I tried so hard to keep any pony from following me. This isn't what I wanted at all. Then she looked at me again, and this time I could tell she was seeing the wounds and the weapons. You're the one out there shooting up everything? You are, aren't you? Wait, why was I suddenly feeling like I'd done something wrong? Yes, like I said, I'm here to rescue you. Rescue? Little Pip. Oh my gosh, she remembered my name. I'm not a prisoner. I'm here of my own volition. What? What? You're... here? With slavers. I couldn't tell which was breaking faster. My head or my heart. You're... working with slavers? She stared at me, her voice cool. And you're cutting a bloody swath through them. How many ponies are dead tonight because of you, little Pip? They're slavers! I was breathing hard, seeing red. And how about the people they support? This is a town, little Pip. There are merchants and tavern owners and work ponies here. Have you killed any of them? Are you sure? No, I haven't. I'm sure. Well, unless some of the townsfolk wear slaver armor and carry slaver guns and were shooting at me. And the slaves? Do you think you can kill slaver ponies and they won't retaliate? Do you think they won't take it out on the helpless ponies to make an example? Now, not if we rescue them first, I thought savagely. But instead of arguing further, I forced myself to be calm. This was Velvet Remedy. I'd give her a chance to explain herself. In an even tone as I could muster. Why? Velvet Remedy's voice never raised, nor wavered. I was near shouting, and she was keeping her poise. It made me want to scream even more. When I left the stable, after leaving a message to any pony from following me, she gave me a pointed look, I came upon a band of ponies who had been set upon by a horrific beast. There was only one survivor, badly wounded and missing a leg. So of course, I galloped to his leg. Did you know I've always wanted to be a medical pony? I bound his wounds and carried him back to his camp. It was a slaver camp, and there were several ponies there who were in severe need of aid, particularly amongst the captives. Velvet Remedy looked about the boxcar, which I began to realize was not her cell, but her room. I've been with them ever since. I just stared. But you're helping slavers! Velvet Remedy turned away from me, staring at her wall of yellow medical boxes with pink butterflies. Casually, as if thinking about the weather, cloudy with a chance of rain, gunfire, and bladed dismemberment. She told me, I read in a book once, back when I was about your age, that when Fluttershy, the mayor of the Ministry of Peace, herself, stepped onto a battlefield, she insisted that her healing ponies tend to everyone's wounds on the battlefield. Everyone. Pony, zebra, to her, it didn't matter. She turned a level gaze at me and slowly asked, How could I do any less? It's different! Oh? She challenged. How? 
Because these slavers, who are killing people and selling others into slavery and death, even foals, and the zebras were just... The zebras just wiped out our cities. I stomped on the ground. Okay, maybe I didn't have any logical reason why this was any different. But it felt different. Look, I tried reasonably. These slaver ponies. When you save one of them, you're making it possible for them to hurt and kill other ponies. Destroy lives. The slaves you heal? They're being sold into horrible work that ends up killing them. The slavers are just using you, so these poor ponies survive the trip into hell. Velvet well, Remedy looked pained. You think I don't know that? But what else can I do? I'm just one pony. And I will not do nothing. Would you have me just trot away from suffering ponies because they have the misfortune of being captives of slavers? Now, finally, I felt the ground reasserting itself beneath my hooves. You can help me rescue them. She chuckled sadly, shaking her head. Rescue them? The two of us? Against all those slavers? She looked me over. Not that I doubt your resolve, or your firepower, but we would be horribly outnumbered. I could feel myself grinning. I'm not alone. We have support. And he's a Pegasus. Her resistance was crumbling, but she still shook her head. Even if we did, then what? Did you also bring enough food for the slaves? Water? We are many days trot from the nearest friendly settlement, and many of the poor ponies I have been tending are in no condition for such a trip. Some of them are foals. Her gaze traveled to my lame leg, and her eyes widened. Oh dear! She pointed her forehoof. It doesn't look like you are in any condition either. If we had a few hours, I could tend to that, but... She sat back, her voice full of regret. Oh, I admire your bravery and sacrifice. But little Pip, did you really think this through? Of course I thought it through. I stammered, a little crossly, and mostly honest. I have a train. Oh, her eyes widened to a surprise, and for the first time, her voice was hopeful rather than hurting. That might work. Calamity stood guard atop the sheriff's office as Velvet Remedy and I made our way to the cells inside. Nearly half a dozen colts and fillies, reeking of filth and sorrow, looked up at our approach, their eyes fearful. That Fear softened as they saw Velvet Remedy, and she smiled gently at them in return. I have good news, little ponies, she said softly, hesitating with a grimace before stepping over the headless bulk of one of the guards. Clamity had cleared the way. We're all going on a train ride. I was already at work on the lock for the first cage. I glanced over, admiring how she was with the foals nuzzling them through the bars. She had been, I could tell, the one good thing in their bleak, awful lives here. My eyes slid down to their flanks, to her flanks, noticing the amusement, not for the first time, that she had two medical boxes strapped to the sides as her saddlebags. Only now realizing that the scarlet and golden streaks in her hair and tail had suggested similarly to the pink and yellow that now associated with the Ministry of Peace. Also, why didn't I think of that? Those metal boxes would provide better protection and added armor for the flanks as well. The tumblers slid into place, and I pulled open the cage. The little ponies inside looked at me with missed expressions. Joy, hope, and a fearful reluctance to let either into their hearts. We've got incoming. Calamity's voice spoke through the sounds of the rain. Whoa, little Pip, we've got trouble. Big trouble. Velvet Remedy shot me to worried expression. Like the hope I had built up in her was shattering. Moving deftly, I snuck up to the nearest window and looked out. Two ponies were sliding 
up towards the sheriff's office, clopping through the small river that the streets used to be. A third watched over them from atop a boxcar and kept down to walk between them. The two on either side wore heavy battle saddles, but it was the figure in between that caught my attention. She was tall, her body extruding a graceful malice and strength I had not imagined in any pony. In truth, she hardly looked like a pony at all. From her hooves to the long spiral horn on her head, and to her wings. A winged unicorn? Awestruck, I drew on the only figures like this in my memory. C Celestia? Luna? The voice of the mysterious dark mare carried majestically through the torrent. We will give you just one chance to come out. Do so, or we will bring the whole building down upon your ears. My mind reeled. I felt my hooves stepping forwards, pulling me towards the door. But I stopped, as I locked onto the one thing my heart insisted to be true. Neither goddess Celestia nor goddess Luna would support such horrible ponies. Whoever this creature was, she did not deserve my reverence. My atheistic friend on the roof had a moment of pause, but with a yee and a ha, Calamity dived towards the enemy trio, firing twice. Four bullets struck home, and the pony to the left of the not a goddess fell with a splash, blood washing over the strange mare's hooves and down the river that was Main Street. The strange mare responded with a whiny laugh that had no gentleness of soul. Such impudence! I gasped as the mare's horn glowed, a sickly green, and a blast of lightning ripped from its tip, slamming into Calamity's chest, throwing him back through the sky. Calamity! I focused desperately on my own horns glowing. Calamity had spiraled down, unconscious, and I barely caught him in time, holding him hovering over the minefield that surrounded the slave pens. His eyes blinked open, then widened with terror as he saw the mines below him, his hooves thrashing in panic as he tried to backpedal through the air. Oh, now isn't that touching? The mare turned to the slaver pony, still flanking her, as I guided Calamity to safety. Kill her. The slaver pony trotted forward, the many barrels of his battle saddle pointing at the age and weather-weakened wooden structure. Behind me, I heard Velvet Remedy telling the foals, Lay flat, all of you, low as you can. I turned to see her waving her horn at the cells. And I marvelously marveled as a weak shielding glow wrapped around the cells. Only belated did I realize Velvet Remedy had not thought to place herself within the spell of protection she wove around the children. The roar of the slaver's battle saddle was nothing like the thunder of other guns, but akin to the fury of a dragon. Bullets tore at the side of the building, a great many punching through, perforating the front of the sheriff's office. I dove to the floor behind a metal desk, feeling bullets slice the air just behind me, and then ring out against the metal as they tried to murder the desk. I heard Velvet Remedy cry out, and I heard her fall. The roar paused, as if the battle saddle needed to catch its breath. Jumping up from my position, four hooves on bullet-ridden desk, I stared out of the window and focused. The glow of my horn matched the glow around one, two, three, four of the mines. I pulled them from the mud and carried them towards our enemies as the mi minigunner reloaded. The strange mare saw what I was doing, throwing up a wing and enveloping herself with a sickly green field of energy, a much brighter and stronger version of Velvet Remedy's protection spell. The slaver pony, pony turned towards the floating mines the moment they started beeping. 
He backed up, eyes wide. Beep, 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 boom! The strange mare's shield wetted with blood and organs. The spell had barely flickered at the force of the onslaught. But it had flickered. That was most impressive, she doled. But now, playtime is over. I wasn't paying attention. My eyes were only for Velremedy, who lay in a widening pool of blood. Three of the bullets had struck her. One only grazing, but two sunk deep into her belly. As quickly as I could, I opened one of her medical boxes and pulled out a roll of bandages. The door to the sheriff's office ripped off its hinges and went sailing into the darkness. Go ahead, she taunted. Throw your best spell. No spell came. I had none to throw at her. Oh? She laughed as if someone she had somehow read my mind. No spells? Well, aren't you just a pathetic excuse for a unicorn? I finished binding Velvet as best I could. She stirred, moaning in pain. My heart jumped. And here, we were hoping that the great assassin who decided to assault our town would at least provide us with a challenge. We have been so utterly bored. I focused. My horn began to glow. Telekinesis again? Such a fool's game. She was trotting closer, but stopped several yards from the steps. For the trouble you've caused us, and worse, for wasting our time with your patheticness. First we will kill your friends. Then have them chopped up into a nice stew, which we will feed you. My horn glowed brighter, and I was beginning to sweat with the effort. No, we think we will instead feed them to the foals and make you watch. The glow of my horn flared. A bright underglow developed it, and I began to tremble with exertion. Still not impressed. The strange mare's voice was glorious and impossibly jaded. The light from my horn still poured out the doorway and through the bullet holes of the building, and she couldn't have cared less. So, what's this? Levitating all the little ponies away? You can't send them far enough that we won't catch them. Or maybe you are trying to levitate every gun in the armory. Even if you could, the shield around us will stop any bullet. A second overglow appeared from my horn, enveloping the first. I screamed as the energies burned through me. The strange mare looked from one side to the other, turning in place to see if there was anything behind her but noticed nothing but running water and darkness. Even up, she saw nothing. Oh, enough of this. She turned back to me. You're right, I said, stepping feebly into the doorway. The effort draining such effort from me that I feared I would pass out at any moment. I am small, weak, Pathetic. My crippled leg was wobbling so hard, it made my teeth chatter. My eyes teared from the pain, and I kept my head low, horn to the ground, almost looking worshipful. An sad excuse for a unicorn with no spells, but the fool's cantrip of levitation. Without raising my horn, I looked into her eyes. This close, my light bathed her. I could see she was not actually black, but a dark forest green, with a main street in green and purple. But I've gotten really, really good at it. Again, the mare looked around casually, trying to guess what I was up to. But. I could see just a touch of apprehension in her bored expression. Well, 
If you are not worthless after all, give yourself to us. Join us in unity. Become something greater than this wretched thing you are now. A third layer of brilliant overglow erupted from my horn. The light was blinding. My lame leg gave out agonizingly, and I dropped to one knee. No. Rearing back with disgust, the mayor demanded, Oh, what are you doing? I heard Calamity chuckle nearby, keeping you from casting a shadow. What? The mayor looked down, then up a second time, this time seeing the much softer glow coming from above the sheriff's office. A moment later, the silently gliding box car drifting over the roof had stopped above her. Her eyes went wide with comprehension as I let it go. Slam! The massive wave splashed out of the impact, bowled me over, getting into my nostrils and lungs. I coughed, gasping. I tried to get back on my hooves, but exhaustion smothered me, and I passed out. Footnote. Level up. New perk. Organizer. You are efficient at arranging your inventory in general. This makes it much easier for you to carry that little extra you've always needed. Items with a weight of two or less are considered to weigh half as much for you.